Here we go again. More astronomy lectures. This time we're going to be talking about the stuff that is in between stars. Mostly gas and dust. Start off with just some nice pictures. You may have seen this image before, images like this. This is what we call a nebula. Um, this one in particular is the Orion Nebula. It's in the constellation Orion. Sort of like Orion's sword hanging down. Maybe a sword. So most images that you see like this are produced from young and really hot stars that have formed in this area. And that area has a bunch of dust and gas. That's sort of the clouds that we see there. But the reason we see them is because those young stars are putting out a lot of light, a lot of energy, and so they'll cause the gas and the dust around them to glow. There are multiple ways that that glowing happens. One outlined very briefly here is a lot of this gas that makes up this cloud here is hydrogen, and remember hydrogen is a proton and an electron, and the stars that are in there that are really hot are putting out enough energy where the electrons are being stripped off of the proton. So if you remember, that's called ionization. So then you just have a proton sort of floating around, but it doesn't really like to be charged. And so as soon as it can, it's going to kind of pull in a new electron that it finds, or that it runs into, and become neutral again, become a regular hydrogen atom. But that process of the electron sort of dropping down uh, in through like the orbits that are possible for that electron releases energy in the form of electromagnetic waves, light. And for hydrogen, a lot of those waves are in the visible part of the spectrum, so we can actually see some of this stuff. Something else that's happening here too, though, is some of the darker regions in the nebula are actually due to what we call dust. And we'll get into more of this as we go along, but some of the regions that look a little bit blue are not light that's been absorbed into atoms and then re-emitted like a sort of hydrogen, but more like just uh, reflecting that light. So light shines on it and it will kind of bounce off. Very broadly speaking, the stuff that's in between stars and even in between galaxies, we refer to as the interstellar medium. And I'm probably gonna abbreviate it regularly, so ISM. Yeah. So a very broad term and just keeping in mind that it doesn't include all the stuff that's not stars, right? We have classifications of things for like planets and moons and asteroids. We talk about a number of other kinds of things that are in space that aren't stars. But besides all that stuff, we kind of clump it all together in this interstellar medium. What is that medium made up of? Well, most of it is gas, called interstellar gas. That being like individual atoms and very simple molecules. Makes up about 99% of the interstellar medium. Besides the gas, there's also dust. Basically clumps, things clump together. If enough stuff, enough atoms and molecules clump together, large enough that we start to call it dust. So anywhere from a few to millions to maybe even some billions of atoms or molecules clump together. Makes up a one sort of dust grain. This is about 1% of the interstellar medium. And finally, there's these things that we call cosmic rays. A very small percentage of the interstellar medium, but very interesting sort of things. It's basically um, really simple atomic nuclei, so like ionized atoms. Like if you ever take hydrogen, like I said earlier, and put a bunch of energy into it, you kind of eject the electron, and you just left with this electrically charged nucleus, where hydrogen is just one proton. Or like helium, if you were to do that with helium, strip off both of the electrons, you'd be left with two protons and two neutrons, helium nuclei. So these cosmic rays, for the most part, are atomic nuclei and electrons, and also some positrons or anti-electrons. The thing that really distinguishes these cosmic rays from just being other gas is that they are traveling incredibly quickly. You can say they have a ton of energy, kinetic energy, the energy of motion. In general, they're, they're traveling like 90% the speed of light, if not more. Very, very fast, but a very small percentage overall of the interstellar medium. Let's just say some very broad things about the gas and the dust. So both of them are very low pressure things. This isn't like 
gas like our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is a gas, but it's very high pressure compared to the interstellar gas. This stuff is very, very low pressure, right? Meaning all of the stuff that it's made up of is spread out pretty far from each other. So low pressure, low densities. Dust in general is also very low densities and low pressures, but it is a bit uh, higher than the gas. Still much less than anything we deal with in our sort of terrestrial environment on Earth. The gases can range in temperature quite a lot. From the very, very cold, few Kelvin, like a few degrees above absolute zero, to very hot, very hot, millions of Kelvin. Just to note that in nebula, like the one I showed you a minute ago, with the really hot sort of young stars, the interstellar gas there is typically around 10,000 Kelvin. The dust is generally just cold, fairly cold, uh, 10, 20 Kelvin. Part of the reason why is because if it gets much hotter, then it would start to break apart and it would then kind of become gas. Like I pointed out earlier, the, these glowing nebula um, contain both gas and dust. And I thought, what the heck, this is my class, so I'm going to throw in some of my artwork here. Got a bit of a nebula phase, if you want to call it that. Um, this on the top is what's known as the Pillars of Creation. On the bottom here is what's known as the Stellar Spire. They're actually both within what uh, is termed the Eagle Nebula, the different structures in the Eagle Nebula. Fun stuff. So let's talk a little bit more about this interstellar gas. Like I said, there's a pretty wide range of temperatures uh, that we find this gas at. One of them is like the gas that's in these nebulas, that's being heated by these really young hot stars. So that, that like glow in those nebulas, at least some of it, particularly usually the red colors, is from hydrogen that has been ionized and then reabsorbed in electron. So just bringing back some illustrations I showed you earlier on in the course when we were talking about um, emission and absorption of photons by atoms. On the bottom left there is sort of a depiction of the orbits an electron can be in around a proton. So that's like a hydrogen atom. And each of those orbits has a very particular energy associated with it, and the electron can only exist in those orbits. It can't really be in between. So how does it get from one to the other? Well, it sort of like jumps. Like all of a sudden, boom, it's somewhere else. And the way that that happens, or what causes that to happen, is the electron absorbing energy. It could be like absorbing electromagnetic energy, like absorbing some light, some ultraviolet light, some kind of electromagnetic wave. Shown in the bottom right here is an electron that's orbiting in sort of the lowest state, the smallest orbit. And then along comes a photon, gets absorbed into the um, atom, the electron gains energy and just jumps up. And that photon's gone, it's been absorbed. At some point then the electron will just kind of want to drop back down, and when it drops back down, it spits out a new photon, same energy. So the extreme sort of version of this electron absorbing energy and jumping up to a higher orbit it is absorbing enough energy that the electron just gets boosted out entirely, gets ejected. That would then be uh, ionization, you're removing that electrical charge. So that's what happens quite a lot in these glowing nebula. The stars that are in that area are very hot and producing a lot of ultraviolet light. That ultraviolet light has enough energy that when it sort of runs into a hydrogen atom, it can knock off that electron. It absorbs all that energy and the electron gets kicked out. But again, you're just left with a charged proton, positively charged proton, and so it will or wander around, and if there's any electrons in the area, negatively charged, they're gonna to wanna to get pulled to it and get, get kind of sucked back in to make a new neutral atom. So it's in that process of an electron getting trapped by the proton and sort of pulled into its orbit here, where that hydrogen atom will emit light as the electron sort of drops down into its orbit. And it will emit generally a number of different wavelengths that are very particular for hydrogen. This comes back to the spectral signature of an atom, so like a hydrogen atom, as the electron drops back down, it's kind of shooting out these uh, photons of very particular wavelength. For hydrogen, a lot of those wavelengths are visible light, so it makes it really nice to observe in the visible spectrum. So this kind of process is actually what we call fluorescence, and fluorescence is a broader sort of term, but 
pretty much any time you have ultraviolet light that is somehow being converted to visible light, that's what we call fluorescence. So the ultraviolet light that was produced by these hot stars is eventually converted to visible light that's emitted by these hydrogen atoms when they're reabsorbing electrons, shooting out visible light. So it gets us pretty pictures. So that was like the hot gas just being heated up by some bright stars, some hot stars. I told you also though that some of this interstellar gas gets really hot, millions of degrees. How did it get so hot? Well, to be frank, it's not totally understood, but like a number of things we'll see as we go through this lecture and probably later on the course, when you are trying to imagine how something gets so hot or so energetic or moves so fast, right? These like really, really extreme and incredible sort of energies. We think a lot of that goes back to exploding stars. So an exploding star or the explosion of a star is what we call a supernova. We think basically it's a uh, result of these like shock waves from the supernova that heats the interstellar gas in some places to that really, really high temperature. Just to note that it seems like there's about one supernova every hundred years in our galaxy. And whether or not it's in a place that we're going to see it very well, that's another story. It was just kind of a cool animation of a star going supernova. Boom. So you talk about that hot gas, and really, really hot gas. There's also this cold end, because the interstellar gas, I told you, goes down to like a few degrees Kelvin. Very, very cold. And being very, very cold, it doesn't really emit visible light, which makes it hard to see. Though if light is passing through it, is there are some gases that absorb visible light. Some of the strongest ones apparently are calcium and sodium. So those calcium and sodium atoms in some interstellar gas can be useful because if we look at light coming through that gas, we can actually see the absorption spectrum for the spectral signatures of this calcium and sodium in that gas. This illustration or this image here gives you an idea of that process, right? For if we're looking at light coming from a star on the left, we know already that light from a star is going to have these absorption lines, and that's due to the elements and atoms that are in the atmosphere of that star. We talked about that before. So we have this light, it already has these absorption lines. If it then passes through this interstellar cloud, we'll imagine it's mostly gas. There could be interstellar dust in there too. But it's passing through this sort of interstellar gas. When it comes out, there are now more absorption lines. And those lines are due to some of these other elements that are in that uh, gas bomb. You might be thinking to yourself, well, that kind of sucks. Because then it's going to be really confusing looking at stars, right? Because we think the absorption lines are due to the elements of the star, but actually the light passed through some gas, and there's absorption lines in there from some gas, and so you might get confused about the star. Good point, I would say. <laughs> Luckily though, the uh, interstellar gas is much lower pressure, much lower density, is much lower pressure than any of the gases in the stars that you might be looking at. Right? And if you remember, the lower the pressure of the gas, generally the sharper the absorption lines are. Right? Narrow, really sharp lines. So the Absorption lines that we see from the star, they're actually due to the star's atmosphere, are going to be a bit broader than the lines that we would see from elements in some kind of interstellar cloud. So that's nice. But still, not really easy to see this sort of cold gas, cold interstellar gas. Not easy to see it in the visible range. But remember, we have more than the visible range. One uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that turns out to be really useful for observing the cold interstellar gas is the radio portion of the spectrum. So remember, from visible, radio is a longer wavelength. So from visible, there's like infrared and then you might say microwave and then radio. Sometimes microwave is just incorporated into the radio part. But radio is basically the longest wavelengths, very long wavelengths, and they stretch Quite a lot, right? Could be from some centimeters wavelength all the way up to like meters to kilometer long wavelengths. 
being much longer wavelengths, they're also lower energy, and so they're associated with much lower energy sort of happenings in an atom. Something else that happens in an atom that produces electromagnetic uh, waves that are just much lower energy than visible is this process that's shown here in the middle in A and B. And it goes something like this. The proton in the nucleus of the atom and the electron in some ways act very much like they are like planets in a sun, the electrons orbiting around, but the electron's also revolving on its axis. It's not actually revolving, very subtle, nuanced things. But basically we can think about it as if it is revolving around an axis, and the proton too. And as it turns out, there is a difference in the overall energy of the atom when the electron is sort of revolving in the same direction as the proton, like in uh, picture A there, versus when the electron is revolving in the opposite direction. Its rotation is sort of flipped in a way. Got to go the opposite. You'd be here. There's, it's a pretty small amount of energy between those two setups, but it turns out A is slightly larger energy overall than B, and so when a hydrogen atom goes from being in state A, where that revolving is happening in the same direction, to state B, where it's happening in opposite directions, that change in energy needs to be released somehow. That's where we get this photon. And this is a radio wave photon whose wavelength is 21 centimeters. It's very nice because even when hydrogen is very cold, it will still be doing this process. So that cold interstellar dust that we couldn't see in the visible range, if we look at the intensity of this 21 centimeter wavelength emission, radio wave emission, then we can see it. One picture that kind of puts together a bunch of observations of this 21 centimeter emission is down there in the corner. Um, and that's actually a, a picture of the whole galaxy where the bar in the middle is like the sort of plane of the galaxy. And that's like the whole sky just being pushed into this 2D map. And the colors are basically just indicating how strong of that emission is for that 21 centimeter line, which indicates also like how much cold gas there is in that area. So the really intense like red area in the middle is a lot of that uh, gas. The green, a bit less. There's just kind of like this disk of cold gas that pervades the whole disk of the uh, Milky Way, broadly speaking. Right? It's all over the place. But it doesn't like spread out up and down. Right? It's sort of like fairly thin sort of disk of cold gas. We're probably going to see more pictures like that map there. Uh, so I'm going to say something briefly about that. This is sort of like how we make maps of the whole sky, or the universe in a sense you could say. It is similar in a way to how we draw two-dimensional maps of the Earth. Right? The Earth is a sphere, or very close to a sphere, it's a little bit bulge. Basically it's a sphere, and it's not the most convenient thing to always have a sphere around in order to see the Earth. So we've uh, come up with ways to picture the Earth on a two-dimensional surface, like this. They all in some way sort of take that globe and like split somewhere and kind of like it's almost like peeling off the sort of rind of a of like an orange and then trying to like spread it out and the way you spread it out can distort different parts of the map so in this one we're taking like the surface of the earth and then like spreading it out and putting it on this plane in these sorts of pictures we're taking like the celestial sphere right all the sphere that we look out and then splitting it somewhere and pushing it and uh, kind of laying it flat or trying to lay it flat same sort of thing happens though, because we're pushing this three-dimensional uh, view onto a two-dimensional space, there's always going to be some warping that happens in places. But this is at least a way of looking at like the whole sky in one place. But enough about the gas. I also told you that there's interstellar dust, and then that dust is made up of the sort of larger clumps of atoms and molecules. There's an example of one of those like dust grains over here. It's about uh, 10 micrometers or 10 microns across, which is roughly on the order of the thickness of human hair. I'm not sure exactly what that's made up of, but just like tiny little dust grains. So all of the dust that we see is relatively cool. Like I said, if it got hotter, it probably wouldn't be dust anymore. It'd probably start to break apart and become gas. 
if enough of that dust starts to clump together, then the outer edges of these like dust clouds block light from getting into the interior, and the interior gets to be even cooler. And when you get even cooler, then larger and larger molecules can start to form. And if that cloud collects enough dust and gets dense enough, then you don't just block regular light, you start blocking ultraviolet light from entering into that cloud. And that's what we start calling it this like molecular cloud, where it's dense enough that you get some fairly complex molecules forming inside. And actually it seems like once we get to this stage of uh, what we call a molecular cloud, this is a place where star formation can begin. Because we have these sort of like cool, dense clouds and the interiors are able to start clumping together more and more and more because the light and energy from outside isn't coming in to break them apart. So gravity is pulling this stuff together and it's actually allowed to like keep clumping together more and more and more. And eventually if you get dense enough, then it starts to kind of get a runaway effect and collapse starts. So being very dense and blocking visible light and then ultraviolet light if it's dense enough, uh, these clouds just look like dark patches, right? at least in the visible part of the spectrum. So this is Barnard 68, it's about 500 light years away from us and it's about half a light year across. And there are some people a while ago who thought this was just like a hole uh, through the galaxy. No, it turns out it's a dense clump, relatively dense clump of dust. So when you see pictures of nebula, they're usually like dark areas. Right? And so those dark areas are molecular clouds where the dust has gotten dense enough that it blocks light from passing through. One very famous example of that is this horsehead nebula. And you can see like this sort of dark shape of what looks like a roughly a horse head. So we don't see anything in the visible part of the spectrum, but again, we have more than visible. So like infrared part of the spectrum, we actually do see some of that dust cloud. If you look closely at the image on the right, this is in infrared and some of the areas of the horse head that are dark over there are now glowing right? because they're actually emitting infrared radiation which is basically that dust that's being uh, heated up and uh, glowing a little bit just from the that heat overall and also if you look in the left image there's like a dark splat kind of thing on the very far left in the middle and if you look at that in infrared it's glowing real bright in infrared so you don't see anything through there invisible but certainly glowing quite a bit in infrared. Just another image that's infrared. It's an image of our galaxy, at least like the plane of our galaxy. And so if you look in infrared, you actually see that there is a good bit of these dust clouds sort of throughout the Milky Way. So the lighter green stuff is like less dense, just sort of dust, interstellar dust. And then I think the redder parts are um, even denser, what we might call molecular clouds. There are some areas that are so dense that they still aren't even really um, emitting infrared. Yeah, just like speckled throughout with this dust. I mentioned at the beginning that some of those dust clouds will appear to be blue. And the effect, as I mentioned, is more of like reflecting of light. It's not light that's actually being absorbed by any of the dust. It's kind of bouncing off of it. So being that it's just reflection, we call that a reflection nebula. And this kind of effect is happening in the Pleiades. It's a star cluster in Taurus. So the Pleiades is like a collection of a number of stars that are near each other. And I guess they are currently sort of passing through an interstellar dust cloud. And we can see that dust because the light from the stars of the Pleiades is being reflected off of it and sort of bouncing our way. So just like the interstellar gas um, affecting the light that we see of stars, right? We're looking at a star through a cloud of interstellar gas. As I mentioned, there's going to be more absorption lines generally. And that's from the stuff that's in that uh, cloud. If that cloud also has dust or is generally made up of dust, then there's sort of more effects that happen. One has to do with sort of that reflection thing where um, a lot of the shorter wavelengths, like blues, are generally going to be scattered or reflect off of the dust. So the stars emitting all these different wavelengths, we're just looking at like a bluish and reddish wavelength here, 
But as the blue starts to encounter that cloud, if it's dense enough, then it's going to start scattering in all these different directions. So that uh, blue, or a lot of that blue light doesn't make it to us. Versus the longer wavelengths, the red end of the spectrum, um, is long enough where it kind of doesn't really encounter as much of that dust, and so more of it's going to make it through. So being that a lot of the blue gets scattered and more of the red makes it to us, this is called interstellar reddening, where the star that we would see is going to look a bit redder than it would if it, there wasn't that dust cloud there. Beyond just reddening, right, we're also just losing some of the light that's coming from the star. So the star also is going to be a bit dimmer. And that process is known as interstellar extinction, sort of like the dying off of the light as it passes through the dust cloud. So that sucks for visible light, um, but again, we got more than visible. Infrared, for one, is still pretty nice for these interstellar dust clouds. So this is the same dust cloud we looked at earlier. Right? In the visible range, you can't see anything. It just looks black in the middle. However, if we look at that same area in radio, then we do see a lot of the stuff that's behind it. It still looks a bit dimmer because, I mean, I'm assuming because the dust cloud is still absorbing some of the radio, but not all of it. So we get to see all the stuff that's back there, it just looks a bit dimmer. And in fact, in the original image, if you look carefully, like around the edges of this uh, interstellar dust cloud, then you can actually see, just in the visible image, a bit of that like extinction and reddening happening. And that is more around the edges, like when you don't block out the light entirely, if you look towards the edges, it's like less dense area of these clouds. And all of these stars that are around the edge look generally a bit redder than the rest of the stars in the image, and also just fainter. So that dimming and reddening, that's your interstellar extinction and interstellar reddening. Here we have a simulation, right? You can actually take this picture of the Milky Way, because we barely even got to the edge of our solar system, let alone out of our galaxy. However, we got a lot of information, and we can make some pretty good predictions as to what the distribution of stuff in the Milky Way looks like. So this is a simulation of the distribution of the interstellar medium, gas and dust. As I told you at the beginning, most of the medium is made up of just gas, and even most of that is cool uh, hydrogen, neutral hydrogen. Neutral meaning not ionized. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of like the greenish colors overall. Then in the yellowish sort of areas, or when that gas has gotten really collected, enough to start clumping into dust, and that dust to clump into clouds, to form these molecular clouds. There are some areas that look like just sort of holes, and I guess that's due to supernova, stars exploding and pushing the interstellar medium away from them, like some of the shock wave pushing stuff out. Okay, so the last component of the interstellar media, I told you it was cosmic rays. And rays is maybe a confusing term. It's not like sun rays or like sunlight, but that's the term we have, cosmic rays. And yeah, as I told you, these are uh, very simple particles like protons and electrons and very simple atomic nuclei that are moving very, very fast. Some of this stuff we know does come from the sun, but not very much of it. Most of it comes from outside of our solar system, and some of the really high energy stuff we think comes from even other galaxies or outside of our galaxy. So of these cosmic rays, the vast majority are protons. So this is ionized hydrogen, hydrogen that's been stripped of an electron. Next down in the list are other uh, atomic nuclei, like helium, it's been stripped of its electrons, or beryllium, same thing, lithium. Right? So it's just the nucleus of these atoms. We're just zooming through the universe. Very nice. And then also, a uh, percent or so is electrons. They're very rough percentages. Beyond that, I've told you a little bit about antimatter before. And in fact, some cosmic rays are antimatter made up of antimatter, so like anti-electrons or positrons, or anti-protons. Kind of difficult to get an image, or to make an image that makes sense for cosmic rays. So that was the best I got. Just imagine really incredibly small things zooming 
really, really fast. The last thing to note about these cosmic rays is that they're all electrically charged. A proton is a positive charge. All these atomic nuclei, they don't have any of their electrons. All that negative charge has been taken away. These are positively charged. Electrons have a negative electrical charge. Uh, Anti-electrons, anti-protons also have electrical charge. This is a big reason why it's difficult to determine where cosmic rays are coming from, or even what sorts of objects they're coming from. So where are they from? We're not sure. We have ideas. Why is being charged a problem? Well, if you think about like the light that comes to Earth, or that makes it to Earth from like the sun, from other stars in our galaxy, even from other galaxies, pretty much comes in a straight line. Once it leaves its source, like the sun, it zooms right at us. Right? For our stars, once the light leaves its surface, it comes straight to us. So we can look back, yep, that's where it came from. The fact that cosmic rays are electrically charged means that they're going to be deflected or turned by magnetic fields. When an electrically charged object moves through a magnetic field, uh, it will feel a force and it will get turned. It will get deflected. Pretty sure I mentioned before, but there's magnetic fields throughout our galaxy. Even in our solar system, the sun produces magnetic fields, the earth produces magnetic fields, some of the other planets and even some of the moons produce magnetic fields. So other stars produce magnetic fields. There's a lot of stuff that is electrically charged that's moving around and that's how you make a magnetic field. And so in our galaxy, there's just magnetic fields all over the place. And some places they're very intense, some places they are fairly uniform, like they kind of all flow in one direction. Other places they kind of wrap around a lot more and twist in. So if you imagine one of these cosmic rays being created somewhere far away from us, and it's like trying to come in our direction, it's going to encounter all kinds of magnetic fields that are just going to start to deflect it and turn it. So it's moving along and it's turned off. No longer is coming from its source. Meaning that the cosmic rays that do reach Earth didn't come straight to us. So much more difficult to try to pinpoint where cosmic rays are coming from. This is another image of the Milky Way, or like of our sky almost, um, right, where the whole this whole part of the sky has just been like mapped onto two-dimensional plane. And all those sort of wavy lines are representing the magnetic fields throughout the galaxy. So if you imagine something like trying to move through, anywhere it hits one of these lines, it's going to start to get turned and pushed around. It's really hard to imagine something going straight through. Interesting. Kind of reminiscent of like an impressionist painting almost. Like I said, we do have ideas of what might be generating these cosmic rays. And once again, that comes back to supernovas, or supernova. This sort of the leading theory is that during the process of a star exploding, one of the things that generally happens is you create this uh, shock wave that travels out from the star, or the now dead star. And part of what makes up that shock wave also generates very strong magnetic fields. So you have this like wave moving out from the star, and in that uh, wave front, there are very strong magnetic fields. What ends up happening then is that you have charged particles like protons or electrons that are in that shock wave. They tend to get like bounced around in the shock wave as it's moving away from the star. Right? So the shock wave is moving out, and you have these uh, protons, say, in the shock wave, and they're bouncing back and forth in that shock wave as it moves out. But every time they bounce around, they're actually gaining energy from the, those magnetic fields, and so they're speeding up, they're accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. Every time they bounce around, accelerating, until they get fast enough where they're going like close to the speed of light and they are able to zoom out of that shock wave. So there you go, that's sort of the leading idea of what creates a lot of the cosmic rays. So in the animation on the top, that is of a supernova, I think that might be, yeah, 1987A. So this was a supernova, I think actually in another galaxy but we observed it's so bright that we observed it on Earth. And then down here, I put an animation to give you just some idea of how like a wave front might help accelerate an object. So a surfer kind of uses a wave front to push it along, but you maybe have also seen like dolphins riding waves too. And so they're doing a similar thing where like the wave is sort of rolling along and they just uh, use it to uh, kind of glide along. I don't know if they get accelerated, quite as much as the things in these supernova shockwaves do, but 
That's a nice sort of visual. It's like this wave front moving along and speeding things up, speeding things up, and eventually shoot out the shark. Last point to make is very similar to points I've made before in that, you know, it's not so simple as there is gas, there is dust, there is molecular clouds, there is cosmic rays, right? Nothing in the galaxy is static. It's not just there, it stays there. So all the components of the interstellar medium are generally going to sort of get cycled through each other. So if it's interstellar gas, maybe it's neutral, right? It's not electrically charged, but it becomes ionized, right? And it's really hot, it gets ionized. Or it goes from ionized to being uh, neutral. Or you might have stuff that's cold and gets hot, or then it gets cold again. It was dense, or it's diffuse, dense again. So it's this constant sort of cycling or like dance almost to the stuff that makes up our galaxy. And part of that whole cycle is star formation. As I mentioned in those molecular clouds, sort of think um, star formation sort of takes off. And so stuff that was maybe interstellar gas that eventually clumped together enough to start being like grains, dust grains, we would call them interstellar dust, and then to uh, clouds of that dust together that get densed up to molecular clouds and then those start to collapse in together and we get stars in there. But throughout the lifetime of a star it's blowing out its solar wind and so it's releasing some of the gas back into the galaxy and into the universe. During the end of its life when it goes supernova it blows a lot of that stuff just back out throughout the galaxy. Then we get more gas, and then again, that whole process starts again. Maybe you have gas start to cool down, we become dust, we become molecular clouds, become stars again. This is a repeating process, or a sort of, it's like a cyclic process. There are definitely some things on that image that I haven't really told you about, and we're just not going to worry about so much right now. Um, but the last thing to note is that this whole process, or this whole cycle, we to call it cosmic cycle, it's not just going on within our galaxy. Right? There's stuff flowing between galaxies, too, like there's intergalactic dust, if you will, or intergalactic gas. And sometimes there are clouds of that flow into our galaxy. And sometimes when you have really energetic things happening, like really strong uh, supernova, some of our gas gets blown out, out of our galaxy. It might eventually reach another galaxy. So even though we term this interstellar media, interstellar medium, like most other things in the universe, we like to categorize it, but generally it's part of a process. Right? There's a cycle going on. Cool. That is it for this lecture, and so I will see you at the next one.